So, building on my alkane nomenclature video and the steps naming organic molecules that I laid out in it, this one is all about functional group nomenclature. I'll be starting with the highest priority groups and moving in order downwards. As I discuss how to name each, I'll be constructing a chart that makes it easy to compare their prefixes, suffixes, and relative priorities. Nomenclature questions on the MCAT are very common, appearing in both discrete and passage sections, and they typically involve molecules with a few different functional groups, so memorizing this chart is definitely worthwhile. So let's begin. So just like they added a zeroth law to thermodynamics, I'm adding a step zero to nomenclature, and that is to identify the highest priority functional group. As I said in my intro, typical nomenclature questions on the MCAT have multiple functional groups, and you need to identify the highest priority one in order to name it properly. In this example, it's the amide group. Once you've identified it, then move on to steps one to four. Step one is modified so that the longest chain must now contain the highest priority functional group. Step three is modified as well. The functional group gets the lowest possible number no matter what. Don't misinterpret this to mean that it's necessarily given position one though. Uh, for terminal groups, yes, but for others, no. Now, I'm gonna start at the top with the highest priority groups first because it makes more sense. You probably learned them like I did, starting with the lowest priority groups and working your way up, just because that's how it's taught in your course or in an MCAT book. But this doesn't help you learn the prefixes, which are essential on the exam. You could probably name an aldehyde rather easily, but what about when the carbonyl group is a substituent? How do you name it then? Does the prefix come readily to mind? If not, it should have after you've watched this video anyway. So, carboxylic acids are king. Since they are top dog, you don't need to learn any prefixes for them. And for the top groups in general, don't worry about the prefixes so much, just get the suffixes down. It's when we start to get towards the middle of the chart that paying attention to prefixes becomes important. Uh, anyways, carboxylic acids are named by adding the suffix oic acid onto the chain. This first example here is called hexanoic acid. Now what I'd recommend as you watch this video is to try to name the examples before I get to them. You can pause as you like and that should give you really good practice. Now, carboxylic acids, as terminal functional groups, will be given position 1, which is why you don't need to name the first one 1-hexanoic one acid, it's just assumed. This also makes the second example 4-methyl-hexanoic acid. And finally, the third example is 5-6-dimethyl-octanoic acid. Next up, we have esters, which are the first of three carboxylic acid derivatives on this chart, and the next two will be derivatives as well. Uh, and that's something good to remember for test day, in case, in case you can't quite remember the exact order, is that carboxylic acid derivatives round out the top. Now, there are two parts to naming esters. The first is to name the substituent on the carboxyl oxygen, the single bonded oxygen, and then to add the suffix O8 onto the main chain, which makes the first example ethyl butanoate. Any substituents would then be sandwiched between this two-part name, making example two methyl 4,5-dimethylhexanoate. Example 3 is a special case. When the main chain is a ring, the ester is named cyclo-whatever carboxylate, which means this one is propyl cyclohexane carboxylate. The way you get to this is, if example 3 were a carboxylic acid, it would be called cyclohexane carboxylic acid. So you chop off the ic acid part of the name, and then add the ester suffix, minus the O of course, to get carboxylate. You name the other derivatives this way as well if their main chain is a ring by chopping off ic acid or ilic acid and adding the suffix. Uh, that's something good to know on test day. Acyl halides come next. They are the most reactive of the carboxylic acid derivatives. You see them used in Friedel-Crafts acylation, for example. They're given the suffix oil halide, which makes the first example propanoyl chloride. Their prefix is halocarbonyl, but again, don't worry about it too much. The second example is benzoyl bromide, and the last one is 4,5-dimethylhexanoyl chloride. So that's it. Pretty simple. Amides are pretty simple as well. You know these as peptides in biochem. The suffix amide is added to the main chain, making the first example propanamide. If there is a substituent attached to the amino group, you designate that as N-alkyl, so number two would be N-ethylbutanamide. And number three, the amide group does not take priority, so we name it as a substituent, taking the prefix amido, which means the molecule is called 6-amido-hexanoic acid. Moving on to nitriles. Here's where you really want to start to focus on both the prefix and the suffix, and that goes for all of these middle-of-the-chart groups, as you can really expect to see them in either capacity on the MCAT. Uh, 
Nitriles aren't super common in nomenclature questions. Uh, they're very strong nucleophiles, so you're more likely to see them in an SN1, SN2, or nucleophilic addition reaction on the test. Uh, so I only give two examples here. The first is propane nitrile, and the second is for cyanopentanoyl chloride as the acyl halide takes priority. Okay, aldehydes. They're named by adding the suffix al, so the first example is hexanal. They are terminal just like carboxylic acids, and as such, don't need a number to specify where the functional group is. Number two is a special case. When attached to a ring, they are given the suffix carbaldehyde, making this one cyclohexane carbaldehyde. Simple enough. Uh, and moving on to number three, aldehydes take the prefix oxo when attached to the main chain, but use the prefix formal when not. Uh, so given that it's attached to the main chain here and the ester takes priority, example three is called ethyl 4 oxo butanoid. You do have to number the aldehyde when it is a substituent. Ketones are next. They are internal carbonyls and therefore don't get position one and are named with the suffix own making the first example to pentanone. Now you'll notice that ketones have the same prefix as aldehydes, oxo. But keep in mind that due to being terminal, aldehydes are slightly more oxidized and do take priority over ketones. They're not tied. That makes the second example for oxohexanal. The last example here is something typical of what you might see on the MCAT. It looks complicated, but break it down into the steps and it becomes easy. So step zero, obviously it's an amide. Step one makes it propanamide, but how do you name and number the ring ketone for steps two and three? Use the parentheses method. This makes the molecule three, parentheses, two oxocyclopentyl, close parentheses, propanamide. Moving on to alcohols and thiols. Alcohols take the prefix, or take the suffix all, and can be named in two ways. The first example can be called one butanol or butan one all. It's just preference which you use, but I learned the second one. It's just going to be more useful uh, on the exam. Alcohols do need a number indicating where the group is because they can be primary, secondary, or tertiary. Example two is a secondary alcohol and it is called two hexanol. They take the prefix hydroxy when not the highest priority group, making the third example five hydroxy to heptanone. Example four is a thiol. It contains sulfur instead of oxygen. Um, and this one is one pentane thiol. You might see sulfur containing compounds on the MCAT, but the chances are kind of low. Um, just in case, I decided to put it on here anyway. They're slightly lower in priority than alcohols, and the way I remember this is that sulfur is just under oxygen on the periodic table, so thiols are just under alcohols on the functional group priority chart. Next are amines and imines. Amines are named similarly to amides, but they do need numbers to indicate the position of the group, which makes the first one 1-butanamine. Just like amides, if they are secondary or higher, an alkyl is used for substituents, which makes the second example N-ethyl-1-propanamine. The third example is N-methyl-3-pentanamine. The prefix is amino, so example 4 would then be 7-amino-3-octanol. Uh, and this last example here is an imine, which is a nitrogen double bonded to a carbon rather than single bonded for amines. Uh, and similar to thiols, they're less likely to show up on the MCAT, but just in case they do, they do follow the rules of amines and naming. Um, so this last example is one butane imine. Alkenes and alkynes are next up. Alkenes contain a carbon-carbon double bond and are given the suffix ene rather than ane. This first example here is therefore 2-butene, but that's not it. Remember, with alkenes, you must also indicate which isomer it is. Since the hydrogens are on opposite sides of the double bond, this is trans-2-butene. Example 2 is the opposite isomer, cis-2-butene, as both the hydrogens are on the same side of the double bond. Now, if those hydrogens are replaced by substituents, you call the isomers E or Z. If the higher priority substituents are on the same side of the bond, it is Z, and if they are on opposite, it is E. And the mnemonic for remembering this is Z Zame Zide. The higher the atomic number, the higher priority the substituent has for alkyl uh, chains. The longer the chain, the higher priority it has. This makes example 3 Z 3-methyl-2-pentene and example 4 E 3-methyl-2-pentene. For both 
cycloalkenes and alkynes. They're assumed to be at position 1, so numbers aren't needed to indicate that. The first example here is for methylcyclohexene. Example 2 has an alkene with a hydroxyl group, which does take priority. It is therefore named trans 3 hexen 2 all Now you can see why I said learn the second of the two alcohol um, IUPAC nomenclature because it's going to be more useful on the test day because when it's paired with an alkene, it uses the same format. Uh, example 3 is named in a similar fashion as trans 3 heptanoic acid. And now on to alkynes. YNE replaces ANE, so the first example is 1 octine. The second example is 7 methyl 3 octine. The last example is both an alkene and an alkyne. Whichever group has the lowest number gets it, but when the same lowest number is achieved in either direction, like we have here, tie goes to the alkene, which makes this 2 non N 7 ine. Now, alkanes, which I did in a previous video, go just under alkanes on our chart, so here they are. And from here on out, um, now at the bottom of the chart, none of these groups really has priority over another one. They're all just substituents and on the MCAT, you really only need to know their prefixes because they are so far down. So ethers are really easy. They take the prefix alkoxy, which makes our first example methoxyethane. Example two is a substance you're familiar with. In lab, when you see a bottle labeled ether, that is actually diethyl ether or ethoxyethane under IUPAC nomenclature. Example 3 is another MCAT difficulty type molecule. It is Z for methoxy for hexenoic acid. And finally, I didn't put an example on here, but um, three membered cyclic ethers are called epoxides or oxyranes. On to alkyl halides, which are really easy as well. They take the prefix fluoro, chloro, bromo, or iodo, depending on which halogen it is. Uh, example one is 2 chlorobutane, and example two is 3 bromo, 2 methyl pentane. And lastly, we have nitro groups, which you see on aromatic rings and are named just as easily as alkyl halides. He places the prefix nitro before the parent hydrocarbon. So number one is nitrobenzene. And number two is TNT, or 246-trinitrotoluene under IUPAC. So that's it. Now, since nomenclature appears so often on the MCAT, memorizing this chart can net you a correct answer to a question rather easily, so I definitely do that. But say your nerves are causing you to forget, or you're having a tip-of-the-tongue moment on test day, and you just can't recall this chart, what should you do? Well, you can recall the general trend here, which is that the more oxidized something is, that is, the more bonds to oxygen it has, the higher priority it is, and from that, you can make your best guess. And now, one last thing before we go to the questions. Uh, this is just something extra, but here's some useful common names to know. They're widely used and can show up on the test. The benzene derivatives are probably the most important ones. I'll probably cover them again in an aromatics video, but I definitely wanted to include them here as well. So, on to the questions. Go ahead and name or draw these. They are typical of the difficulty of nomenclature questions you will see in the MCAT, but they're harder because you don't have multiple choice options. Uh, pause the video here while you work on them, and after you resume, the answer slide should appear in about five seconds, so pause it now. And here are the answers. Pause the video again if you would like more time to review them. So there you have it. Assuming you have this chart more or less memorized, nomenclature questions are an easy place to pick up a point on the MCAT. Remember, it's a multiple choice test, so that any answer choice that names a molecule after a lower priority functional group should jump out at you as incorrect and can be eliminated right away. As always, do more problems until you feel confident and you'll be sitting pretty for test day.